For me, if there's one handheld that's aged like fine wine, it's undoubtedly the Nintendo Game Boy Advance. When it released back in 2001, we have to remember that the video game landscape was much different to what it is now. In the home, we had the likes of the GameCube, original Xbox, Sega Dreamcast and Sony PlayStation 2. All were powerful systems capable of some incredible things. 3D had well and truly arrived, but there was clear separation of what we could play on the home consoles versus handheld. Before the GBA, Nintendo opted for the Game Boy and Game Boy Color. These were low-powered 8-bit machines that were limited in what they could achieve. Of course, many developers would challenge these limits and produce technical excellence. Meanwhile, Nintendo's competition, the likes of Bandai's Wonderswan and SNK's Neo Geo Pocket and Pocket Color, was 16-bit handhelds and they were excellent devices. But it's fair to say that Nintendo's Game Boy Advance transformed the handheld landscape. The GBA would eclipse everything else available on handhelds at the time, and it was just $99. Not only was the system 32 bits, the LCD screen can display up to 32,000 colors or 15 bits. It has a resolution of 240 by 160 pixels and a refresh rate at 60 hertz. The aspect ratio is 3 to 2, which was a very interesting choice at the time. The 3 to 2 aspect ratio is unique to the GBA, and it's almost, but not quite, a widescreen display. Nintendo would advertise this feature in some unique ways. For example, on Super Mario Advance, a launch game for the hardware, its introduction would show a smaller viewport where the game would match something more akin to a Game Boy's 10 to 9 aspect ratio. Then the game would open up this viewport to proudly display the wider 3-2 aspect ratio of the hardware. Just like the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, NES and Super NES, the GBA came stock with very fast 2D hardware that was tile-based, with various modes of operation in terms of number of layers and colors that could be displayed on screen at once but it also featured unique bitmap modes that could be used for many 3D games. Yep, that's right, the GBA had its own frame buffer. According to some early previews, including Edge Magazine issue 87, developers appeared to be lukewarm on the hardware. In terms of 2D abilities, the Advance is probably a little less powerful than a Super NES. In terms of 3D, it's probably like a Super NES with a Super FX chip so it's got crude but fair abilities. The developers hadn't needn't worry. As we would soon find out, the GBA was plenty powerful, and it all ran on just two AA batteries. The heart of the GBA undoubtedly is the 16.8 MHz ARM7 TDMI processor, which is a 32-bit RISC CPU, which was a massive leap over the 8-bit processors in the earlier handhelds like the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color. This allowed for more complex games with better AI and smoother gameplay. This shift to ARM and the 32-bit jump in power cannot be understated, and the GBA was the very first handheld to use an ARM chip, something that continued into the Nintendo DS and 3DS era, and now the hybrid era with the Switch and now the up-and-coming Nintendo Switch 2. Nintendo's transition into ARM chips was something that originally went back as far as 1994, so on a train from uh, Nintendo to a ski weekend at Matsumoto in 1994, and literally on a napkin, uh, I started writing uh, uh, the 16-bit instruction set. It was pretty much the same one that I used in my thesis. Nintendo were in talks with ARM on partnering on new hardware, and they were determined that their handheld strategy was to focus on cheaper, lower-powered SOCs or system on a chip, which offered unique hardware different from the competition, it was also low power and low cost as we mentioned, but it also would alleviate any concerns of using off-the-shelf parts that could open up the system to potential security issues. The GBA, for all intents and purposes, is a 32-bit system. However, its data bus is only 16 bits wide. By itself, the ARM7 instruction set isn't optimized for this because each ARM instruction is 32 bits and everything is expressed as 32 bits of data. So for example, if you only wanted to work with 16 bits of data, then it has to be converted to 32 bits wide, which is not efficient and can easily bottleneck the hardware. 
Fortunately, Nintendo and ARM came up with a solution to add a second instruction set specifically for the 16-bit instructions. This was known as the Thumb Instruction Set. Now you might be wondering, why bother with a 32-bit chip if there's only a 16-bit data bus? The GBA has a unique memory architecture that on paper may seem to be a little convoluted, but it allowed developers in practice to extract amazing performance from the handheld. Inside the SoC itself lives two blocks of memory, IWRAM and VRAM. VRAM is 96K and it's the frame buffer region that's used for graphics rendering. The internal work RAM or IWRAM is 32K in size and it's 32 bits wide. And the external work RAM or EWRAM is 256K in size, but as we said previously, it's 16 bits wide. Getting the very best performance from the GBA required clever use of each of these three pools of memory. Developers had overhead to optimize code with two different instruction sets, and often code was hand-rolled using assembly to optimize and squeeze as much performance out of the hardware as possible. If you watched my recent video about the Motorola 68000, we discussed the vast number of registers available for that processor. The ARM7 TDMI chip continued that trend, offering 16 general purpose 32-bit registers and used a 32-bit internal data bus and ALU inside the SoC to access the IW RAM. It also implemented a three-stage pipeline, another first for handhelds. This meant that the CPU can fetch, decode and execute up to three instructions at the same time. We're talking about parallelism on a single chip. Nintendo would originally market the GBA as a 2D handheld, and this is where the hardware really came into its own. The GBA got its reputation and label as a portable SNES because of the many SNES ports that came to the hardware. Its tile-based graphics modes also supported effects like Mode 7, which were easily recreated on the hardware thanks to its powerful PPU that supported mosaic effects, alpha blending, windows and affine background layers. Sprites can also apply affine transformations, another first for handhelds. SNES ports was definitely a huge selling point for the hardware. While many were faithful recreations, there were definitely some limitations that developers needed to overcome. More specifically, the reduction in pixel resolution of the GBA compared to the SNES, as well as various color palette adjustments that were required in order to make the LCD screen appear more brighter, and the conversion of any audio processing from the dedicated SNES sound chips to the Game Boy Advance. Many of these SNES ports were of a good quality, but I think it's fair to say that none of them really match the heights of the originals. And where the GBA really came into its own were the exclusive games that were developed specifically for the hardware in mind. The GBA's release in 2001 was at the twilight of 2D games at the time, but because 2D pixel artistry had gotten so good by this point, many artists were already experienced working over many years on 2D games, the GBA would offer some incredible looking 2D visuals. Now because of the hardware limits, many games that were originally running on home consoles that were 3D were often converted to isometric 2D on the GBA. However, a mistake is to think that these games were lesser in quality because of this. A great example is Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 on the GBA. Don't let the isometric style fool you. The skater is rendered in real time 3D and the developers of the game ported most of the PlayStation code to the GBA to retain that Tony Hawk feel and this is why it plays so much like the original. Max Payne on the Game Boy Advance is another game that uses a fixed isometric view. However, notice that the character model in the game Max Payne himself is fully 3D. Another superb game that transitioned to isometric 3D for its GBA port is Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. I singled this one out specifically because every time I go back and take a look at the Game Boy Advance, just when I think that every single game that I know exists for the platform, there is another port that I've never heard of before. And Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance is that game. This is an excellent port to the GBA from the original PS2 version. <laughs> The GBA could also run 3D games, thanks to the bitmap modes and memory specifically for graphics rendering, where pixels could be plotted directly into the 96K of frame buffer and rendered. The GBA itself has no 3D acceleration. Everything had to be done in software. But because of the power and versatility of the architecture, it was possible 
to create software-based 3D engines that can run at great speeds, the likes that we had never seen before on a handheld. There's always a few go-to games when we talk about showing off what the GBA can do in terms of 3D. And developers Fernando Velez and Guillaume de Bale are often credited as some of the very best developers who pushed the GBA's 3D capabilities beyond what was considered possible. Velez and de Bale were experienced software developers who knew how to push hardware. Before the GBA, they designed and programmed a game called Gym Power on the Commodore Amiga. This ran on a stock Amiga with just 7 MHz and it pushed the hardware to its absolute limits. This was a side-scrolling game which was incredibly fluid and colourful, and rather than use the Amiga's dual play field mode for parallax scrolling, instead took advantage of the Amiga's powerful copper processor as well as interesting sprite tricks to show off one of the most colourful and technically impressive games the Amiga ever saw. Over on the GBA, Velez and Bale would tame the GBA to do their bidding. V-Rally 3 is especially one game that really shines on the hardware. The game is fully 3D and visually stunning. But it's one thing to build a fast 3D engine, and it's another to build out an entire game with 35 stages over 7 locations with realistic car movement, handling and physics all running at a fast frame rate. Another notable standout in 3D engine tech on the GBA was the Blue Roses engine developed by Raylight Studios with ports of Smashing Drive to the GBA, which was also fully 3D and contained digital music and speech on the GBA. One of the biggest hidden gems on the GBA was Wing Commander Prophecy. Gone are the 2D billboarded sprites of the original. During the gameplay, Wing Commander Prophecy is fully 3D texture mapped with visuals that run at very good speeds. This is the full Wing Commander experience on the GBA, and really the only letdown is the lack of analog controls. Now, of course, the GBA was also backward compatible with Game Boy and Game Boy Color games out of the box, and this was really a great feature, bringing the vast majority of GB and GBC games forward. And some games would even take advantage of GBA enhancements, specifically if the game was running on the GBA, and we've covered this before on the channel. But what about emulating system without the power of dedicated hardware? Well, that's also possible as well. What's really cool about the GBA is that it's powerful enough to emulate some 8 and even 16-bit hardware entirely in software, and this is where the excellent homebrew community comes into play. The GBA was a well-documented and understood system pretty much as soon as it had released. Although the hardware used a custom SoC, the ARM7 TDMI chip had publicly available documentation which made it easy for hobbyists and emulation developers to hack the system. There was no concept of security and no code was encrypted. Flash cartridges and other homegrown makeshift development kits could be developed to push code to the GBA via link cable, and this opened up the floodgates of the incredible GBA community. A GBA can emulate an NES, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and even 16-bit systems like the PC Engine via the PCE Advanced Emulator that supports many TurboGrafx CD games and runs at very good speeds. And it's the incredible homebrew community that's kept the GBA alive all these years. Games are still being developed for the hardware even today, with Bitmap Euro's port of Xenocrisis, Wave Forward with Shantae Advance, and homebrew efforts including Open Lara, the incredible tech demo of Tomb Raider that we covered a few years ago. And in recent times, a port of Super Mario 64 is in the works, and it's already showing incredible progress. Look. If you haven't figured it out by now, I love the Game Boy Advance. It's a fascinating piece of hardware that developers took advantage of in so many unique ways. It has the right blend of power versus price versus performance. And somehow, it all just ran on two AA batteries. But that's going to do it for today's episode. If you did like this episode, please don't forget to leave me a like and leave a comment below. And as always, we will catch you in the next episode. Bye for now.